It's a pleasure to welcome you. I'm Robin Shapiro. I chair the section of Individual Rights and Responsibilities of the American Bar Association, and we are just delighted to welcome you to our second summit this year with a focus on election issues. We have so many incredible speakers, and we have been uh, honored to work with so many incredible individuals in putting this together that I can hardly wait to turn it over to people who will get to the substance here. But first, there are some people who I really feel a great need to thank. Uh, the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. Uh, they have been fantastic partners, not only last year, but this year, and we hope for many years to come. Many, many thanks to you. Our ABA partner entities as well, the ABA Council on Racial and Ethnic Justice, the ABA Health Law Section, uh, the ABA Section of State and Local Government, and the ABA Standing Committee on Election Law, all invaluable partners to us in uh, this particular uh, election year summit. Um, could not not thank Bob Stein, uh, whose initial vision for the summit uh, came out of his, his head, and who has been just, um, as usual, uh, boundless energy and insight and ideas and imagination in putting this together. I uh, also really want to thank uh, Tanya Terrell and the staff uh, with our section. The, we would be nothing uh, with respect to this or any of our other initiatives without her and them. And now it's my pleasure to welcome you another welcomer. And we are just thrilled that Carolyn Lamb is here to say a couple of introductory remarks to you. Carolyn is the chair-elect designate, can we call it that, of the American Bar Association. In August, she will assume officially the title of chair-elect of the American Bar Association. She certainly earned it. Um, she is, as, as all of you know, I'm sure, not only an incredibly talented and well-respected lawyer with White and Case, but she has given so much to the American Bar Association, and that's before her term begins. So without more, Carolyn, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Well, it, it is a pleasure to be here with you and to welcome you on behalf of the American Bar Association uh, to this wonderful symposium where you're going to be examining such challenging issues for our day. And one of the things that I really want to do as president of the ABA is to increase our role in uh, policy advocacy. I, I think we can do much more in Washington, and this is, this is the perfect kickoff in terms of uh, the thinking about the issues. I, I think the work on immigration, on barriers to the right to vote, on disaster relief in the rule of law, torture and detainee rights. Um, these are just some of the most, most thought-provoking and challenging issues in the civil rights and liberties area uh, that we confront. And I was so impressed to read who your discussion group leaders are in discussing these issues. They are truly some of the, the best and the brightest uh, who will be considering them. And needless to say, the uh, compass that you provide could really help many here in Washington find their way on the issues. We've, we've got to inspire on, on many of these issues. And the issues addressed here really do have impact nationwide. Uh, they are of utmost importance to our profession. They are of utmost importance to our profession ensuring that the rule of law is central uh, to the solutions and uh, to our American way of life. And because these challenges to our civil rights and liberties often affect the people whose voices are not heard, as well as groups that are not as popular with the lawmakers and policymakers in Washington. It is important to have leaders like the American Bar's IR and R section, uh, who I've always regarded as the conscience of the ABA 
and they are really together with the others of you who've come together, the ones that can move us forward and serve as a catalyst for change uh, and, and much needed change on many of these issues. As an organization of lawyers and creative thinkers, the ABA in general and the IRNR in particular have a responsibility to bring a voice to the voiceless and representation to the unrepresented uh, in this area and champion those causes uh, that will bring the necessary change and even causes that may not be politically popular. Questions of civil rights and liberties meet at the intersection of law and policy, and we must have lawyers involved in every part of that intersection and every part of designing the way through it uh, with the rule of law being central to the solution. Uh, in addition to, I think, examining the issues and the challenges that they present, we, we need to define with some creative new ideas and different approaches uh, the, the answers. And then we've got to advocate those answers with those who can make a difference on the Hill, in the administration, in the courts, wherever we need to go to be a catalyst for change on the issues. And during this election year, where hopefully we will uh, witness a peaceful transition of power one way or the other, uh, we must be able to focus on these issues and move them forward and ensure that we as a profession act to safeguard them. And in addition to making a difference at the federal level and nationwide, uh, so many of our members need to go back to their state houses and to their governments on the state level and uh, advocate the same sort of change and attention. You know, everyone always says all politics is local and perhaps a big part of it is. As much as we need to advocate immigration issues at the federal level, you need to push it so that all of the representatives on a local level will uh, embrace the policies and move us forward as a nation. I hope that uh, each of you will uh, embrace the issues and, and take them to where we can uh, make progress. And in the process of so doing, we will be strengthening everyone's rights. So seize the opportunity, enjoy the day to examine these very important issues <laughs> with some of the best and the brightest. I, I wish you well and a lot of creative thought, and I look forward to working with each of you to make a difference on many of these issues. Many thanks and welcome. a discussion that will not be interrupted uh, by that. Um, the late Senator Moynihan uh, has been in, quoted in a lot of ways, and once when he was involved in a debate, uh, his opponent said, well, you know, aren't I entitled to my own opinion? And his response was, yes, you are entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Uh, today, what we are going to get are both facts and opinion, and we hope that this will enable you to continue to your discussion on these critical issues, whether in D.C. or your own hometown with your state and local bar. And the speakers this morning at the kickoff plenary session to the full day are well able to lead this discussion and set the stage. You have their full bios in the speaker bio form, but let me just mention who they are briefly in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, Lisa Brown is the executive director of our co-sponsor, ACS, and again, thank you for 
uh, being a co-sponsor, she has worked as counsel for the vice president from 1999 to 2001. And ACS has really been an exemplar in reaching out to the states and to law students and law schools to stimulate discussion on the kinds of issues that we have on our agenda. She will be followed by John Payton, uh, who is the newly minted president, director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He has practiced law. He has been a president of the D.C. Bar. And he has just uh, finished his second term as a council member at IRNR. John will be followed by Barbara Arnwine, who is executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, which is engaged in an election protection project of which IRNR is a co-sponsor. And she will be followed by Kay Hodge, who is a partner in a Boston law firm. And Kay is the past president of the Massachusetts Bar, currently is president of the National Conference of Bar Presidents and chair of the ABA's Commission on Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the Profession. And she also is on the IRNR Council. So thank you all for coming. And Lisa, why don't you begin? Thanks. Um, I want to um, join um, Carolyn and Robin and Bob. Can you all hear me? If I don't yank that. Can, you, can everybody hear me? Is that, um, in saying, um, in welcoming all of you, ACS is thrilled to be um, co-sponsoring again with IRR and particularly this election year summit. Um, can I think, is, it, is it okay? Okay. Um, he said we can't hear, so as long as you all, tell me if you can't hear. Um, I wanted to give you a little bit, uh, I, I also am thrilled to be with this panel because um, ACS is really all about um, mobilizing people around the country, educating them, energizing them, and it is people, these are the leaders um, who are actually out there protecting individual rights, and so I'm really honored to be with them this morning. I, to give you a little bit of context for my remarks, I see a number of familiar faces, so I know some of you are familiar with ACS, but I wanted to do just a quick overview, um, which will give some context for what I'm going to say. Um, I hope by the end of this, those of you who are new to ACS will actually be energized by it and get involved in the organization. We are a diverse and dynamic network of lawyers, law students, judges, academics, policymakers, and activists who are advocating a progressive vision of our constitution, law, and public policy. And our mission is essentially to ensure that our nation's founding values of liberty, justice, equality, and the rule of law enjoy their rightful central place in American law. We now have 164 student chapters in 47 states in the District of Columbia, 30 lawyer chapters around the country. We host over 1,000 programs a year now across the country on a wide range of um, legal and policy issues. We have eight working groups. Um, our programs include both a national convention, which will be um, the June 13th to 14th here in Washington, D.C. I encourage you all to come. Also, conferences around the country on issues ranging from voting rights to a progressive national security agenda to constitutional interpretation. And then also all of our chapters regularly hold programs around the country. Um, plus, we're doing Hill briefings and press briefings, so we're an increasing resource for the press, um, giving them progressive voices. Um, and finally, we have a series of publications now, issue, publish, issue briefs electronically, plus our official journal, which is the Harvard Law and Policy Review, and our in-house journal, Advance, publishing um, some of our best issue papers. And I actually encourage you, if you've not seen it, to look at um, our, one of our recent volumes of Advance, which has very short, succinct um, papers on constitutional interpretation um, that are countering originalism, and are really, I think, relevant probably to a lot of work that you all are doing. A uh, major focus of our work this year, not surprisingly, is identifying priorities for a new administration in the areas of law and justice. We'll host a panel at our convention um, that will present ideas um, for what a new administration of either party should do to ensure that the U.S. adheres to the rule of law. And then we'll publish a series of papers fleshing out that topic over the course of the rest of the year, ranging from principles to guide the Department of Justice to ideas for the Department of Homeland Security to keep our nation strong, but also um, be true to our civil liberties. 
Now, panels throughout the day are going to address a series of incredibly important and interesting issues um, that impact individual rights. So I thought I would just set the stage by highlighting what um, I think ACS sees as a few overarching issues that a new administration, and particularly a new attorney general, must address. Uh, first and foremost, torture and the rule of law. Uh, people across the ideological spectrum have raised questions about the now notorious torture memos that were authored by the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice following 9-11. And I, I want to quote Jack Goldsmith, who was half head of the Office of Legal Counsel at Justice during a period of time during the Bush administration. And quote, as I absorbed the opinions, I included that some were deeply flawed, sloppily reasoned, overbroad, and incautious in asserting extraordinary constitutional authorities on behalf of the president. I was astonished and immensely worried to discover that some of our most important counterterrorism policies rested on severely damaged legal foundations. End of quote. Clearly, the public has got to be asking what a new president and attorney general are going to do to ensure that our counterterrorism policies are based on the rule of law. They have to ensure that a, the government bases its policies on detainee treatment, torture, electronic surveillance, on accurate, impartial, and principled legal analysis with respect for the constitutional authority of Congress and the courts. This issue, of course, subsumes a number of sub-issues, um, including the proper role of the Office of Legal Counsel, where, full disclosure, I actually worked for a period of time during the Clinton administration. And, you know, after the first, t the torture memo first came out in 2004, in my personal capacity, unrelated to ACS, I joined a number of other former OLC attorneys in essentially writing a response to the torture memo, setting out principles that should guide the Department of Justice. And it's that, sort of that sort of paper that we need, that it's the type of paper that we are going to be um, publishing in the coming year to make sure in a variety of different areas that we are really giving ideas and um, setting forth principles for the department. Um, the Office of Legal Counsel is supposed to be um, impartial um, and really and give impartial advice, you know, defending <coughs> the Constitution. And part of that can sometimes mean saying no. And that is um, that reputation of the department needs to be restored. Second, if the department's to regain its historical and vital reputation for integrity, independence, impartial administration of justice, um, the Attorney General's got to ensure that the immense powers of the department when brought to bear in criminal prosecution, civil rights enforcement, enforcing other areas of the law, are not tainted by electoral politics. The, the investigation of the U.S. Attorney firings is still ongoing, and there are clearly a lot of unanswered questions still. But if pressure was brought to target criminal proceedings based on party politics, the public's got to ask what policy should be put in place to make sure that doesn't happen again. Related to that, um, the department must address the politicization of hiring. I'm sure many of you saw the quotes from Monica Goodling, who was an assistant to the Attorney General um, when she testified before Congress and said that she, quote, may have gone too far in asking political questions of applicants for career positions and may have taken inappropriate political considerations into account, end quote. Um, a new admin administration must restore the integrity of the department and the vital role of career attorneys in departmental decision making. Finally, I cannot cede the mic um, without noting that judges are, of course, incredibly important to individual rights. And, you know, the reagan meese Justice Department was actually, in a series of documents that they released, um, noted the critical importance of judges to the achievement of legal change. And I want to one quote from the opening of one of the documents. There are few factors that are more critical to determining the course of the nation than the values and philosophies of the men and women who populate the third co-equal branch of the national government, <coughs> the federal judiciary. Well, the price of their focus on the courts is only too evident today. Um, and I think a new administration has got to focus on um, the appointment of federal judges and ensure that their appointment is based on a commitment to justice, excellence, and our core constitutional values, including individual rights and liberties. Um, in practical terms, that commitment would be empty if it didn't mean a commitment to appointing a judiciary that's rich in diversity, reflecting the backgrounds and characteristics that um, run across this nation, as well as a breadth of um, professional experience. So I'm excited that this summit is going to offer expertise and insight on a wide variety of issues related to what I've just mentioned and a series of other topics um, that really should be front and center in this election year. 
Um, when the summit's over, I hope you all are energized to stay involved in these issues, um, and I hope that part of that, um, one way to get be involved in those issues is to be involved in ACS. So if you're not already, please go to our website, um, acslaw.org, get involved with our lawyer chapters. Um, if you're students, get involved in your local student chapter, get involved in one of our working groups, um, which are focused on many of the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Most of all, just stay involved in these issues. So thanks for being here, um, and look forward to learning a lot from all of our other panelists. Okay. Um, <clears throat> does this microphone work for the people that are, okay. Um, I, I want to talk about human rights and civil rights and how that is being addressed in this, I'd say, really exciting year and a half, and it will be two years of, um, you know, presidential election campaigning. Um, and so I want to put... Um, all of this in its proper context and then comment on it. Uh, we've had a sensational year and a half, uh, I think more exciting than anyone would have anticipated when we learned, you know, a year and a half ago when people started their campaigns that this was going to go on forever. Um, <laughs> but it's been uh, energizing. It's energized um, young people in a way I don't think we've ever seen. Uh, it has created an air of optimism that I think was absent from a lot of us in this room, uh, and that's been absolutely terrific. Um, but it has left untouched, I think, one of the core issues that this country has simply never come to full grips with, what to do about issues of race. Um, I have read, I'm sure you've all read, um, comments, op-ed pieces by very prominent people uh, that have said that because of the success of Senator Obama's campaign, that proves we don't have a race problem or that that itself is the solution to the race yeah. problem. Okay, a really, you know, you would just want to dismiss it if it didn't have some resonance out there and people who listen to it. Um, Senator Obama's been extraordinarily successful. I think his candidacy will allow us the opportunity to address some of the problems in a way we've never addressed them and to see them in ways that we've never really been able to see them. But it doesn't mean anything more than that. It itself is an opportunity, terrific opportunity. You know, Senator Clinton's uh, success presents similar chances to address some issues that have really been um, at the core of some of the problems in our country. But it's just possibilities. Now we have to do it. Um, one of the things that has been disappointing is that some of the core issues that relate to race and human rights and civil rights haven't been talked about in these campaigns. They're huge issues. And I'm just, you know, you're right uh, that torture and the rule of law are really huge issues. I don't remember the debate about torture, okay? This should have been really easy, okay? I'm the moderator. I just want you to tell me, candidate X, Y, Z, just, I, here it is, for or against it, okay? If you're president, are you withdrawing the executive order or not? Are you going to close the, you know, I, I don't remember that. I'm disappointed that the core issues that relate to race similarly um, haven't been the topic of any of these debates or the political dialogue. And I'm not saying it hasn't been a rich political dialogue. I think for the most part, maybe excluding this week's debate, but for the most part, we've had a very rich dialogue of political debates. So here's where I want to start, um, and it will become evident uh, uh, in about 30 seconds. Um, two weeks ago, um, America's Promise, that's the organization that Colin Powell uh, started, uh, issued a report on graduation rates in the uh, public high schools in the 50 largest cities. Uh, and this was a very um, uh, brilliant uh, analysis of graduation rates. And the reason you have to have an analysis is, if you didn't know it, um, 
schools don't keep uh, track of data and certainly don't report data that would let you know what the graduation rate is at all. So, for example, if some a student drops out in the ninth grade, they are removed from the denominator. Okay? They are removed from the denominator. If they flunk out in the twelfth grade, they stay in. Okay? If you put those two facts together, you will see there is a really perverse incentive to have the kid drop out in the ninth grade so he doesn't flunk out in the twelfth grade. Okay? Because you lose all responsibility for him if he's not in your denominator. Okay? Therefore, if you just ask schools for the data that they keep under No Child Left Behind or any of the other data, you can't figure out what happened. Okay? So, Chris Swanson does this report, and um, here is the data. It was widely reported all over the place. And I'll just give you just a few data points of the ones I found most shocking. Okay? So, uh, this is the chart. You know, you can go to America's Promise, you go to the website, beautiful charts, and if you go to Table 3, it's the graduation rates in the metropolitan areas of the nation's 50 largest cities, and he does metropolitan area and then urban, surrounding suburbs. Okay, so I'm going down the list right now. Baltimore is at the uh, top, and the graduation rate for Baltimore in the urban district is 34.6. Columbus, Ohio, it's 40.9. Cleveland, it's 42.2. New York City, it's 47.4. Denver, it's 46.8. Philadelphia, it's 49. Let me give you the one that matters to me. If you just subtract those from 100, you'll get what I'm going to call the dropout rate. Okay? For, I'm going down the list, the dropout rate for those cities is higher than 50%. So over half of the kids in New York City, okay, if, if I just reverse it, Baltimore 65.4, Columbus is 59.1, Cleveland is 57.8, New York is 52.6, Indianapolis is 50.3, Detroit 52.1. Over half the kids are dropping out, okay? Now, um, Brown said that the most important responsibility of our state and local governments is public education because education is the key to good citizenship, dot, 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 in our democracy. Okay? I don't think anyone disagrees with that. Half the kids are dropping out. People who are close to the ground believe these figures are themselves low. Okay? If you read the Washington Post story from last October, they did a front page story on Cardozo High School, not a school across the river, not the most distressed school in D.C., and they found, they tracked kids in in 2001 and who graduated in 2005. Okay? And the answer was, of the kids who entered in 2001, just over 25% graduated in 2005. Now, some left, some transferred out, some transferred. I understand all that, but that's an unbelievable number. Of the kids who didn't drop out, you know the rest of the story. Some of them didn't get educated. So half drop out, some number of the rest didn't get educated. When Brown says that public education is the key to democracy, it's the key to democracy because that is sort of the glue that holds us all together, that we can see each other as peers because we're all <coughs> educated and we can actually view each other. We can all serve together. We can all vote together. We can all be on a jury together. Uh, it is, it's not that it's leveling, it's uplifting that everybody, you know, proudly can have gone to public school or to school and to be part of our robust economy and our dynamic um, democracy. Um, Sixty years ago, uh, when the graduation rates were mm -hmm. undoubtedly lower than what I just read, because we, we have done better and better, but undoubtedly lower, and you know, I have uh, talked about graduation rates, but you know, I skipped over it real fast. When I say within the metropolitan area, 
I hope you know what I'm talking about. We now have cities that are largely all minority, surrounded by white suburbs, and the breakout data is within the urban area and then within the suburban area. And the figures for the suburban areas are, of course, 40 points higher. So the graduation rate for the suburban area is astronomical. So we have schools that are performing a function in the suburbs and are disastrous in the inner cities. And we're talking about black kids and Hispanic kids. That's who we're talking about. That's who's dropping out. Now, the graduation rates, the dropout rates, were probably higher 60 years ago. Um, but the consequence, I would say, was dramatically different. If you dropped out of high school 60 years ago in Detroit, you could go work at the Chevrolet assembly plant, and it would turn into a really good job. They actually <coughs> trained you to do everything. They didn't need you to come with any education. They showed you everything. You could buy a home, and home ownership in Detroit was the highest in the nation. You could send your kids through school. We all know some of those kids who were sent through school. Very good jobs. You could work as a iron worker, you know, work at a steel mill. Um, those jobs either don't exist today or they require high education because you have to read the software and you have to change the line and you got to see exactly and you got to put that in. And if you can't read and write with, profi with proficiency, there are no jobs. So if you drop out today, you go to oblivion, okay? And if you go to oblivion, I'll tell you how the criminal justice system will treat you, okay? So that single thing I've just described will generate, without you needing to know any more, catastrophic criminal justice problems, where people are treated as though they are criminals, and then it may make them criminals. It'll give them records. They can't get jobs. They have no skills. We have nothing that's out there to help them. We don't have any remedial programs once you're in oblivion. And, you know, as the guy from Johns Hopkins who did the dropout factory study said, if you graduate from high school, you may not get a good job. If you don't graduate from high school, the odds are you'll never have a job, good, bad, or otherwise. You'll never have a job. That creates criminal justice issues. It creates catastrophic social issues. Uh, it generates what I'm going to call democracy issues because, in fact, you become excommunicated from our democracy. You can't vote. You can't hold certain jobs. Okay? So we have democracy issues. That's a voting issue. You know, you can have kids and then you can't vote for the members of their school board. You become completely disassociated from your community because you can't be part of the community. Economic justice problems? Gee, we could get you really good jobs, but you're not qualified for any job. We it creates just astronomical education issues because this is the pipeline problem that Justice O'Connor is talking about. Okay, here, here it is. Half the kids drop out. I can tell you what the consequence is down the line. They're gone. Now, that is the core that is feeding most of the problems that we see out there today. Complete catastrophic collapse of inner city K-12, okay? I don't remember this being discussed at all. And I don't think a single thing I just said could be controversial, okay? Not a single thing. Everyone would agree that, yeah, the schools are in a lot of trouble, that it has these consequences. So I would say that fixing K-12 is the domestic issue of our time. It has civil rights and human rights consequences that are unlike any other little thing we've seen for a long time, and we've had no discussion of it. Okay, it's kind of shocking. You know, we want a civil rights division that does what it ought to be doing, okay? I want one. Everybody's going to say, I want one, okay? Well, they can only deal with the problems that sort of are created by this vortex that's generating people to go to oblivion, Okay, and it, it has to deal with them in a way that is appropriate, but if you want to try to stop uh, the proliferation of these problems, you've got to go right to the vortex and fix it. You know, 
I want a really good head of the Civil Rights Division. We now have uh, somebody who has uh, no qualifications in there trying to take care of the Civil Rights Division, which has been destroyed. Okay? We have a Department of Justice that's lost its integrity. I've got to fix all those things. But they will have to deal with all these problems if we don't go to the center of this and fix this right in the center. You know, for a lot of reasons that I think are obvious, the next Secretary of Education could be the most important one we ever have. Could be the most important one we ever have. And this is one where, you know, you just go down all of the issues we really care about. You can play on the edges, and at some point you have to play on the edges because you've got to deal with what happened to the kids today. You've got to deal with that. But you've also got to figure out how you get to sort of the center. So the disappointment is that we have had a sensational year and a half of uh, this campaign, just sensational. But on some of the things that I believe are in the core of what we have to deal with as a country that relates to race, we haven't had the discussion that we need. Jeremiah Wright has um, generated a discussion of race that I think is very important. But the next step is now to figure out what we do to address some of the problems that race has done to infect our country. The Jeremiah Wright things turned out to actually be, uh, strangely enough, a real discussion about how things are going. But that's just starting it. Okay, so now let's talk about what has to be fixed, and we haven't had that at all. Okay, we just haven't had that at all. We've started it, but we haven't had it. Um, I, you know, I've been on panels for uh, IRR, uh, for ACS, um, for, you know, uh, about uh, issues of uh, torture, uh, presidential power, plenary presidential power. How should we? I'm for all of that being discussed. That's not in this campaign either. So what are our larger issues about what we stand for as a country? What are our larger issues about what we have to be as a country? When Brown says public education is the most important function of state and local governments because good citizenship is the key to our democracy, that's just correct. There's no, no argument there. We're not addressing the collapse of that engine that was producing our democratic possibilities. And I think that really has to be put into this uh, uh, presidential debate as well. Thank you. It's yours. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank the American Bar Association and IRNR for putting on this summit. It is absolutely um, very important to look at all of these many good issues, and it's a great joy to be on this panel uh, with you know so many you know excellent you know leaders and heroes of you know our our current day struggle. Um, you know I am here um, as the executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, 45 year old civil rights legal organization that is. Um, you know, been in the forefront of fighting you know, many challenges in our nation, and of course, no uh, challenge right at this moment is uh, more pressing than that of voting and voting rights. And I wanted to talk about election protection and some of the work that we've been doing. And when I say we, uh, that's a large we, because many of the people in this room are part of the Election Protection Coalition. So I am speaking, you know, for you know all of the many groups that are essential uh, participants in that election. Um, I wanted to also, before I, you know, got into the content, there were uh, yes, I see that echo is getting on my ear, in my ear. I want to um, introduce a few people in the room who uh, from the lawyers committee uh, who have been working uh, very strongly. Uh, on election protection and making sure that everything goes as well as we can this year. I want to introduce John Greenbaum, who is director of our Voting Rights Project. I want to introduce him. He is a, a real gift to our country and has been you know, fighting uh, these issues at DOJ for some eight years and now has been at the Lawyers Committee for about five? Five years, my goodness, uh, time flies. And I also wanted to introduce Nancy Anderson, who is one of our nation's foremost, I think, uh, 
creative thinkers on how you really make law firm pro bono a reality. And she is um, you know, just uh, you know, a real treasure. And I also wanted to introduce a uh, new, um, not so new, I'm sure it's all mine because he's been so busy, a uh, new staff member, and that is Eric Marshall. Uh, who heads up and is the manager uh, for our national uh, campaign for fair elections component, really focusing hard on election protection and election reform. Welcome here. So, uh, as all of us know, you know, after the 2000 election debacle, everyone knew in the civil rights community and in the civic engagement community that there needed to be a new paradigm for how we addressed issues of voter participation, to watch the systematic disenfranchisement of African American voters with such, you know, with such incredible, uh, you know, impunity and then just, you know, this incredible, you know, feeling that they did not matter and our inability to deal with that as it was happening and to really watch the problems of afterwards in the courts, all you can do is go into the courts and talk about next time when all of those people were sitting there with the hurt and the pain of having been denied their most fundamental right in a democracy, and that is the right to vote. So we knew at that point that there needed to be a shift in the way that we dealt with these issues. And organizations came together, People for the American Way, Legal Defense Fund, Lawyers Committee, all of us, ACLU, and we sat down and we said, how do we restructure our operations so that we can be more effective in addressing these problems? And as a result, in its conception, Anita Earls at our office start saying, well, wait a minute, we need a hotline system that is able and capable of responding to voters immediately. We, people start thinking about communications and how do you educate voters to be empowered voters during the voting process. We start talking about recruiting legal volunteers who could participate on the ground as mobile field attorneys and as people who would answer the hotline. We start talking about the preparation of state manuals so that there was really good excellent information for people to use to make sure the rights were there. We start talking about building and extending a coalition that would be powerful and nationwide. So from 2001 to 2003, we operated several what you would call model programs in different states to see how we could do this the best and how we could problem solve as these issues arose with voting irregularities and voting discrimination and voter intimidation and deceptive practices, all of the problems that come under the rubric of election administration. And so in 2004, we ran our first national large scale program with over 8,000 legal volunteers covering some, you know, 25 states, uh, looking at, you know, having field, mobile field attorneys in the floor, and we started promoting very hard and heavily the 1-866-R vote hotline number. And we had several, you know, just uh, a whole scores of law firms that were, you know, uh, participating, and as a result, we created for the first time in the history of this country what is now known as mega pro bono. And it was mega, that's for sure. Um, and what's interesting about it is that this model now is being replicated throughout the country in different ways and in different non-voting sectors. I was fascinated to read the last LSC newsletter, Legal Services Corporation newsletter, in which it reported that in, the North, Carolina, in North Carolina, the president of the North Carolina Bar Association just recently did a mega pro bono program with thousands of, you know, with hundreds of legal volunteers. They took over 7,000 calls, and this was mainly for legal services to outreach to the people who could not get to the storefront offices, who always are looking for lawyers, and this was a way of bringing private attorneys into that legal services network in a very creative way to try to cover people who normally had no access to justice. 
obviously using the hotline center model that we have been developing. So there are potentials, you know, for this model that extends even beyond uh, its original conceptualization for addressing voting problems. So then in 2006, we had 3,000 volunteers. We didn't have a dime because everybody thought 2006 was going to be a doggy election, as they called it, and didn't think it was going to be meaningful, nothing was going to happen. And of course, voters came out and had a sea change of difference of, of what they thought our government should look like. And fortunately, election protection uh, went out there and was, you know, we built a program regardless of, you know, the lack of funding. And we received without any ability to really advertise over 25,000 calls. We were able to affect thousands and hundreds and thousands of voters by making sure the polls were kept open, etc. 2008 presidential <laughs> election. Well, we thought, uh, you know, we would cover Super Tuesday, it's a, the traditional Super Tuesday. Nobody saw this protracted uh, primary process coming. No one understood that we were going to have, you know, one election, uh, one primary so process after another, in which every one of them was the quote critical primary. Um, so, you know, now we are <laughs> going from you know, thinking that we were going to only be doing this in February to looking at June. Uh, so it is <laughs> a whole different reality for us. And it definitely has, you know, uh, put, you know, many, many uh, different plannings. So one of the things I want you to make sure you do before you leave the room today is to grab a copy of this report. I believe, Eric, it's on the table over there. Uh, and you will see in this report, this is a report on the primaries. And it's only on the primaries that have occurred so far. There will be more. We will do a comprehensive report in June uh, when all these primaries are over. Uh, but it's very, very important to look at it because it's going to tell you a whole lot of things. One that I think is really important is that from, from the time of the first primary uh, this year until now, we have had, as part of election protection, over 80 partners, 40 law firm partners, and 1,000 legal volunteers who have participated. We have covered over 31 states already. Uh, we have had, you know, a number of states with, you know, very uh, strong uh, local programs in uh, California, Georgia, Illinois, New York. Uh, we did, you know, uh, then we did the Potomac primaries, District of Columbia, Maryland, Virginia. We did the uh, second Super Tuesday, as they call it, with the Texas Two-Step, Ohio, uh, you know, uh, Rhode Island, etc. cetera. Um, and we are now moving into Pennsylvania. Uh, for the upcoming primary, and we'll be covering North Carolina and all everything else that's left in between. Um, what we do in election protection, and what's so critical about election protection, is that it's a comprehensive legal program that really tries to put a national framework on this disparate state-oriented system of voting. And what we do is try to make sure that all the election processes operate correctly. And what I want you to look at when you see this report, be sure to turn to page three <coughs> and page four as it begins to summarize what we've seen to date. And I think it's critically to, to analyze that because that tells us what to expect in November uh, and what we should be looking at the things that we as lawyers as legal volunteers, as people of, who are civically engaged, what we need to do to make sure that November is a, an effective election. The challenges are severe. One of the things that's are frightening to me about this report that really shocked me is that in 04 and 06, almost uh, two thirds of every problem we saw in election protection as we tried to protect voters' rights were related to registration issues. In the primaries, what we have seen instead is a dramatic shift of the nature of the problems. Now we're seeing 54 to 57 percent of all problems being related to poll, locate, poll pro, polling place problems and equipment, voter equipment problems. 
So what we are having is a total breakdown in election administration, which is very severe. We're seeing poll workers who are not trained appropriately, have no idea what they're doing. They went for their two-hour training, probably slept through it, I guess, uh, and they've shown up at the polls, and they don't know what to do. Uh, we're having equipment uh, you know, problems because people don't know how to turn on the machines, they don't know how to put the cards in, they don't know anything. We're seeing problems with lack of balance. Think about it. For those of you who were here in the, uh, in the Potomac area, and you watched your polling places in Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia run out of ballots. Some as early as 1 o'clock in the afternoon. <coughs> and that's because that goes to one of the real problems in our democracy, is that as much as we bemoan and talk about the problems with non-participation of voters, we are not prepared to handle a true voter turnout. So here we go from having, if you look at the report, it documents that for many of the states in 04, their, their voter participation doubled, tripled in some instances, because people have been registering, and unlike the past, they are actually showing up and voting. And a lot of those new voters are youth voters and African-American voters. And when they have arrived at these polling places, the polling places have not been set up. They've been set up to basically, at the maximum, handle a 30% voter turnout. And when 41% of people are showing up to vote, they're not capable of handling them. That is a challenge for us long term around electoral reform issues. We saw everything, and I won't go through it all because it's, it will take all day, um, and that's not what we have. But let me just uh, finish on a couple of other really important points. How can you help in 2008? We need 10,000 legal volunteers. We've already had 1,000 just in the primaries, but to do the work that has to be done between now and November. We need 10,000 legal volunteers. We need them in a number of you know, designated states. We need them throughout the country. Uh, and what we want you to help us do is to recruit those volunteers. We want you to help us to enlist your law firms as strong supporters of election protection to urge the attorneys within your law firms to be active in the process, to urge law students at your law schools to be active in the process, to urge non-lawyers to also be of assistance in getting out the 1-866-R-VOTE hotline number so that people will know. The hotline right now operates during the, you know, the, during the time that there are elections taking place. But beginning in August, it will run continuously, every day or every working day, um, until the actual November election, because we will be assisting with voter registration issues, we'll be assisting people to verify their voting registration, we'll be assisting with a whole series of prob uh, problems, and that hotline will run out of Washington, D.C., and we will need a huge core huge core of legal volunteers to undergird and support that hotline. Then throughout the country, we will need volunteers at the various, how many, John, 26 probably hotline centers? <laughs> somewhere, somewhere around there. Right. Uh, and we will need you very much, and we will need mobile fill attorneys, because what's so beautiful <laughs> about mobile fill attorneys is, remember, our, the reason why we do this is to solve problems. So when a poll's not open, how do you solve the problem? You have somebody, you've got to have a lawyer sitting at the Board of Elections. You've got to have somebody answering the hotline to even hear that problems exist. You've got to send mobile field attorneys out there to figure out what's wrong, precisely why they're not open. And you call that Board of Elections and you say, listen, it's not open. You need to get it up. If you don't, we're going to have to take you know, whatever action is required in the law, and they do what has to be done. So solving problems is part of, is, you know, it's everything. Because there's nothing in the world more beautiful. And I will stop here. There's nothing in the world more beautiful than when a voter tells you, 
Our polling place is down. There's 5,000 people who vote here. It's not open. What am I going to do? Because if I go to somewhere else and vote, my vote won't be counted, possibly, in you know, the correct precinct voting districts. And what is so beautiful when they call you back and they say, thank you. Your people are here. They just opened the polls. People are now voting. They say, thank you. They, fi they found my registration because you told them where to look. They say, thank you because you made sure that the ballots got here when they ran out of ballots. Thus, that's what democracy is and its essence is for us to be able to do those, but long range. We want to do the electoral reform long range, we, as we will be doing for the next several months. We'll be meeting with election officials, showing them this data from the primaries from 2004, 2006, and saying we got to fix this before election day so that there will be lesser of these problems. So we need you. I hope you will join us. The Election Protection Coalition is everyone. It is America's promise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And I thank you know, IRR and the American Constitution Group and um, all of these panelists. I don't know why I'm here, because I'm not speaking about the substance. Uh, but I'm here as a representative of the National Conference of Bar Presidents. And what we are is a national organization. We're not the ABA, but we're a national organization of presidents, presidents-elects, and those in the leadership who are going to be presidents and leading state, local, and other special focus bars. And that's important here because bar leaders are folks who care about issues and want to help to mobilize their membership to address and solve the issues that we face. And I know that I see Carolyn Lamb, and she's been very active in our association. And many, many of the people in this room all have roots as former bar presidents. And the National Conference is an organization that helps to bring to the attention of these bar leaders um, issues that they ought to think about and address. And one of the things that I think is so important is that as I hear Barbara Arnwine talk about the need about the program that she has, as I talk, listen to John Payton talk about the education issues, as I hear about the torture issues, one of the things that I am puzzling over is how do we connect up those dots between the issue and this wonderful cadre of folks lawyers who participate in state and local and special focus bar associations who are there and want to support this democracy however they may do so. And the thing that's really fascinating to me is that we, that lawyers care in their souls. That's why they became lawyers. I mean, Tommy Wells calls it those who have answered the calling, if you will. Um, you know, we're called to help the justice system work, to help the justice system do justice. And issues like civil rights and civil liberties and social justice are at the very core, among the most important of the values of our profession and the issues that our profession addresses. Now, there are so many of these issues and so many needs. But in my experience, when the need is there, bar associations and their members are ready to stand up. And one of the things that we need to do is to figure out how to connect those folks together. And I would urge each of you, whatever your organization is, I would urge you, Barbara, because to, to reach out to state and local bars, to get them mobilized, to help on the various issues. Because the bottom line is, and it comes from Tip O'Neill, who was, as you know, um, speaker for many, many years here in Washington, but he represented a small district in Cambridge. And they sent him back to Congress so many times that he became the speaker. And he would say that all politics is local. And it is. And state and local bars are in every area of this country. We cover every state, most counties. We also cover most large metropolitan areas. And yet, somehow, institutionally, we go over them and into the, trying to get the lawyers. And I believe that there's an opportunity for the collaboration. Because if you were to talk to the constituency that I represent, they're looking to collaborate. 
They are looking to find ways to work with others who have the special expertise that a bar association may or may not have. And I, and I think that we're here to be there and to, I'm certainly here to help make those connections and help to encourage, encourage my membership to become a part of that solution. I have heard about Barbara's project through the American Bar Association election law project. I don't know if folks are aware that the ABA has a major initiative regarding election law. And the fact of the matter is, is I knew nothing about the Lawyers Committee program until I went to one of those meetings, you know, in the bowels of a, of a hotel, and I learned that that program was there. Likewise, the ABA has a program about the pipeline, and it ought to start thinking about how it's going to address the issues that John Payton raises. And we obviously have IRR in a number of places, because I see Neil Sonnet over there reading his paper, but he's <laughs> also <laughs> good at it. <laughs> there, you see? That is a criminal lawyer for you. Always on his toes. But in any event, I do think that it is, it is so important that as you seek out lawyers to help you with your projects, and as you try to gain the foot soldiers, if you will, to help us to make this democracy stronger, that you think about the connection and the possible collaboration with state and local bars, because I do think that they are extraordinarily available, and I believe underutilized. Let me give you an example on this election issue, because independent of knowing very much about the project, and I'm going to now go read the, the, the documents that Barbara has directed us to, when I went to the ABA program, it became very clear to me that this is actually something the bar associations can do. They can mobilize, you know, lawyer in the, lawyer, lawyers to be in every classroom in the state on a particular day. Likewise, they can mobilize lawyers to be at every polling site on one day, the election day. And they are also great at CLE, continuing legal education. We can pull lawyers together and train them on all of the various issues in a, in a fairly set discrete period of time. They're not going to become experts in election law, but they don't need to be. Exactly. They need to know these are the things you look for, these are the answers, and we are very good at solving problems. You know that lawyers can get something filed that literally is coming off the copy machine at one end and across town to the clerk's office if it, it needs to be filed. <laughs> so that we can get ballots to wherever ballots need to go because that's what lawyers do. So that I would urge us to think about gaining, you know, making the collaboration with the Bar Association, getting them engaged, and being able to then move into ensuring that they work on um, perhaps being what I would call, and I see, I mean, I see in my state, you know, a lawyer at every polling site being a source of information, a potential source of mediation, helping to mediate between the, the, the voter and the various individuals. And I do know many of the folks who are sitting in my polling site um, actually know the process well, but unfortunately are not very good at explaining it. They've been sitting there, I think, since the beginning of time, you know, taking ballots, and therefore aren't very good at explaining uh, to others, particularly the newcomers to the system, be they young people, be they individuals of color or from other cultural backgrounds or languages who are new citizens of our country, uh, regardless of their race, they will often have issues and questions. And I gotta say, it is intimidating. I keep saying to my husband, I can't remember which precinct I'm in. You know, and I'm often going, you know, from one line to the other trying to remember just because it's not something that I keep in the forefront of my mind. So I do think that you need to think about when you're looking for large groups of volunteers and for whatever your project might be, think about lawyers. I've spent a lot of my time uh, as in the law working with bar associations, and I can tell you the way bar association projects start. They start with one person who's willing, who has an idea about a problem that needs to be solved and are willing to then talk to their peers and have the energy and the time to commit to the project, and before you know it, you have a bar association project and then you have solutions that are beginning to be developed. And so I am here to tell you that bars are here, 
lawyers are waiting, and I hope that we can collaborate and we can develop those partnerships for a real win-win, because I think it's working together through volunteer organizations of all kinds that we're going to begin to solve the problems and to strengthen this democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of the panel members. We do have time for questions, and I encourage you to stand up. I don't know if we have any mics other than this one, but if you can, and identify yourself, please, and keep the questions as brief as possible. Are there any? Please sit. <laughs> Well, I think um, you heard um, how I think we have to see the problem, which is we have to fix K-12. Um, here's one of the uh, missing parts of No Child Left Behind, which I hope there will be no resistance to fixing, which is having the data that you need to be able to see just how schools are performing. So that when I say you don't have to report dropouts, that's a flaw in the system that No Child Left Behind has set up, unintended flaw. That, you know, this wasn't done on purpose. But that's a little thing that I think they should just fix it so that schools have to keep track uh, and report who came in and, you know, what happened to them. And that, that's a really key point. I, I don't have a problem with um, sort of trying to figure out um, how we keep track of data. We just ought to do it more completely. Um, no Child Left Behind isn't even designed to try to deal with what I call the core issue. So I'm not here saying I'm criticizing No Child Left Behind. It wasn't designed to deal with the core issue. Let me give you a slightly different frame, and uh, everybody will get this one too. When um, the Army recruits people to be in the Army. You know what they do. They go to a shopping mall and they literally will sign up anyone who comes along. Okay? They essentially ask no questions. They used to say we want only high school grads. They dropped that. They used to say we uh, will screen out anyone who has a record. They've dropped that. Okay? They don't take everybody in that, that but they still, you know, so they, those aren't, so they get a hundred people and because, as we all know, they have no margin, uh, they then tell their folks that, you know, for I want them all to be soldiers. I, I want them all to be soldiers. And if they can't read, you get them to read. And if they can't understand the software that runs, you just get them to do that. And the Army has a different view of responsibility. You know, it is essentially 100 in, 100 out. You're responsible for all the people that come your way. I want a school to be responsible for all the kids that come their way. If they show up in the first grade, I want you to be responsible for graduating them in the sixth grade. If they show up in the seventh, I want them to be responsible for graduating them in the ninth, tenth, twelfth. And if they move to Houston, okay. But if they're in your jurisdiction, you ought to be responsible. And we ought to get rid of these sort of perverse incentives. Um, and I just think this is a different view of how this ought to work. And I don't think it is foreign at all. Everybody actually thinks that's what schools ought to be doing. And so my point is not to criticize No Child Left Behind. It's not designed to do that. Okay? It, you know, it can collect data better. And I think everybody ought to now start thinking about how we want to give our schools much broader responsibility because it's such a key thing uh, that we just have to have fixed. We had one more question here, and then Carolyn. Okay. Go, please. Yeah, this may be kind of cynical, but to what extent 
is the growth of the prison industrial complex would be a uh, disincentive and actually the dropout rate in the, which you say the benefit actually feeds that. So you create the, the, the appealing to an industrial complex in which actually it employs one degree uh, suburbanites in jobs <laughs> and uh, where they can have a, with an entry into the middle class with a non degree middle class job overseeing the incarceration of the urban dropout class. And to what degree is that going to be an uh, incentive to uh, actually perpetuate that type of program? But look, look. The, but, the, but the answer is look, uh, look, we have probation officers and parole officers and police officers and correctional officers whose jobs depend on there being large flows through their systems. That's true. And to some extent, I guess they have an incentive to want to keep their jobs because their jobs depend on those flows. But we don't. Uh, and, you know, uh, I think we become too cynical. Uh, and if, you, if we had a room full of them and we said, uh, would you rather have a society where your job is not necessary or a society where your job is necessary, everybody's going to say a job where my job, you know, they'll give the right answer. I understand that there are perverse incentives in there so that people think in their own self-interest, you know, it's better if we just, I think we can handle that. We just have to actually address the core problems. The, what fuels it is people think that we have runaway crime all over the place. And if we stop the engine that is helping foster the crime, and we are a place that therefore can actually see each other as just people and deal with, give people good education, they'll get jobs, they'll own homes, they'll be contributing members of their community, I don't think anyone will look back with any nostalgia to when we used to have a prison right there. Okay? <laughs> That we started with Carolyn, and we will end with Carolyn. Well, thanks. Well, John, you, you outline an incredible problem, and I think it's a problem with a great deal of urgency in terms of a need of a solution. And, you know, some of it requires, I think, some fairly systemic programmatic reform in terms of what goes on in educational institutions. I mean, we have one tiny microcosm of success here in D.C. with the Luke Moore Academy that deals with dropouts in a very... A proficient way, but there needs to be that, it sounds like, nationwide. So some of it is programmatic, a lot of it's financial, some of it's talent base and training. Uh, how, what are you suggesting that the profession can do or that we can do as a community to move this forward with the kind of critical urgency that's needed to get some, number one, attention, and number two, funds? Uh, I, I think this, that um, uh, we are um, by far, uh, by any measure you want, we're the most uh, powerful profession in this country. We're the largest profession in this country. Uh, we play critical roles in every center of power. We help draft all the things that direct power in this country. That's what we do. And, you know, when Kay says we, we can mobilize and be all over the place, we can mobilize and be all over the place. So the first point is to see this as the problem that it is. And then to say that its solution is key to everybody in this country and that it's key to even our own profession. You know, one of the issues is we want to make sure our profession becomes more and more diverse because we want power to itself be diverse. Well, if we don't fix this, that can't happen. So part of it is our very powerful profession ought to recognize what has to happen in our country. And I agree with you. There's a lot of different things that have to happen here. But the first, that's why I started out, the first is a recognition of the problem. The disappointment about what's not being discussed in the presidential campaign, th that's a denial. Okay? That's a denial of what the problem is. And we ought to say, yes, we are only lawyers. Lawyers do have a role in this, but we want to tell you we are pretty perceptive about what happens inside a democracy because we're key players, and here's something that's broken inside our democracy. And we have some role in helping to fix it, but everybody has to have a role in helping to fix it. So I think that's sort of the platform that we have here. 
There are some panel discussions that are a very good statement of issues. There are others that are calls to action, and sometimes there are some which provide a context to what those issues are and why we need a call to action. This morning we have heard all three, and I would like to thank our panelists for that. Uh, and we will have a very brief break. The breakout rooms are through that corridor, and we will start again with the three breakout sessions at about 10.30. But first, a thanks to our panelists.